Hello, and welcome to episode number 100 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacademian. In our modern, technologically sophisticated world, it is something of a wonder that a medium such as the podcast continues to thrive. When podcasts first began to emerge in the new era of mini audio devices known as iPods, which speaks, of course, to the origin of the name, many saw them as a nostalgic throwback to the era of radio plays before even the advent of television. The fact that the podcast medium continues to hold its own even well into the 2020s suggests there is something deeply enduring about the experience of tuning into real human voices in order to feel an authentic human connection. For me personally, it has been a profoundly rewarding experience to build that connection with a dedicated podcast audience that feels very much like a kind of extended family, a tribe, if you will. And as we make note of this, the 100th episode of Point of Convergence, I think it bears pausing for a moment to celebrate not only this milestone in the life of the podcast, but also the human journey we all share, one that draws each of us to this mysterious collection of topics centered around anomalous and therefore extraordinary experience. Truth be told, what you have primarily witnessed over these many episodes is my own indulgence of curiosity, for it is primarily questions rather than answers that have driven this quest, one centered around both hard and incontrovertible data, but also an intuitive sense that the world we are all a part of is made up of so much more than what we've been led to believe in our conventional, reductionistically materialist society. To mark this turning over into the triple digits, I plan to make this episode partly a retrospective of sorts, one in which I take some time to look back at the meandering, but also synchronistically orchestrated path that has brought us here to episode 100. What lessons have been learned along the way in exploring the so-called UFO phenomenon and related topics? And how might some additional but associated notions, such as that of a hologram or a hollow movement, which we'll delve into today, help shed further light not just on the anomalous, but also on the ultimate nature of reality itself? These are the particular questions we'll seek to indulge in this, the 100th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. As we begin, I'd just like to point out that if you'd like to gain access to all of my content, which includes not just Point of Convergence and Liminal Frames, but also OTC Squared and the various feature series I create, in addition to live Q&A sessions with me, and access to my Discord server, as well as discounts and early access to online courses and private retreats, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacademian or by subscribing on Spotify. All right, let's dive into this episode number 100, worth celebrating to be sure. And as I said in the beginning, this will partly be a retrospective of sorts, looking back at lessons learned. But in addition, we will also go a little further than we have before in exploring the notion of a hollow movement, which relates to the notion of a hologram. This is a further extrapolation of some of the notions we pursued in terms of idealism, the notions that physical stuff might not be what it appears to be, and this points to the fundamental structure of reality itself. Now, of course, this being episode 100, that means we have 99 episodes to reflect on. I won't go through each of those, but I will discuss some of the major movements that happened. This began by, in a way, kind of stabbing into the abyss. And what I mean by that is when I began this podcast, I knew that I wanted it to be about the connection between not just the UFO phenomenon and aliens in contact with various kinds of non-human intelligence, but also related topics such as near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, psi phenomena encounters with apparitions, etc. All of these matters somehow are connected. That has been clear to me for quite some time now. And of course, they're not just connected in some random way. They speak to the fundamental nature of reality itself. 
and the fact that each of them are kind of outliers in our conventional understanding of reality suggests that our conventional understanding of reality is insufficient, perhaps even woefully inadequate. Now, to that point, I think one thing that has become clear over the course of this podcast is that we are a remarkably stubborn species when it comes to paying attention to outlier data. Even when the outlier data becomes such a substantive and significant body of data that it should be at that point pointing towards the notion that your understanding of reality is wrong. And again, not just missing some pieces, but perhaps barking up the wrong tree altogether. Now, a moment ago, I began by saying that the beginning of this podcast was a bit like stabbing into the abyss. And what I mean by that is that I knew that I had this collection of related topics that I wanted to explore, but wasn't exactly sure how to begin. So I just dove in head first with the first episode being UFOs and the phenomenon. And from there, we went into other topics like psi phenomena, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and even different fields of inquiry that are all pointing towards some similar notions in terms of the fundamental nature of reality. But in those early episodes, which were shorter than the ones more recently, I was just trying different avenues, looking to explore this, poke and prod and see where it led me. And as I said in the introduction, this has very much been my own exploration of things that I'm just naturally curious about. And I think my assumption is what has resonated with many of you is that you are curious about some of the very same notions. And that being the case, I just want to say cheers. I'm happy that we're on this journey together. Something else those of you who've been tuning in since the beginning may have noticed is that some episodes zoom in while others zoom out. And I sometimes prefaced a certain episode that way. What I mean by that is I think it's worthwhile to pay attention to specific cases and the nuances, the details, the minutia of each of those individual cases so that we really understand what happened. And then over time, we start noticing commonalities amongst these different cases, which expose different patterns within the overarching data. And that led to the kinds of episodes where we zoom out, where we look at the pattern itself of these different cases and what they tell us as a collection. And of course, even in a more macro way, there are also sub-patterns within this overarching pattern. And that's one of the most interesting things I've noticed is that because this is outlier data, because this speaks to notions that many people don't yet accept in our society, many people want to just slot it in as one more piece of an existing puzzle that they think is trustworthy. And as such, they don't pay attention to the nuance of the different cases and even the sub-patterns within the totality. Rather, they just want to talk about what aliens are doing and why they're here. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. We have different kinds of reality scapes that seem to be interacting with us and therefore different origins for these different kinds of beings. Does it make sense to conflate and collapse beings on the astral plane as well as those coming from seemingly elsewhere in our physical cosmos? Not really. But of course, it gets even more complicated when we realize that our notion of a physical cosmos, quote unquote, isn't quite what it seems which again speaks to this notion of a hollow movement that we will get into today. But before we go there, let's just spend some time on the patterns we might have noticed within the totality of the data. One of the patterns that's become clear to me, and this of course relates to my work with the John Mack Institute, has to do with the abduction and hybridization phenomenon. This really came to a head in the 1990s when John Mack was approached by numerous individuals who'd had very similar kinds of experiences. And as I've said on multiple occasions now, to John's credit, he took these people at face value, which doesn't mean he necessarily assumed they were correct or being truthful or weren't delusional, but he at least gave them the time to explain what they experienced. And then based on his decades of experience judging people's accounting of their experiences, looking for signs of delusion, psychopathology, and perhaps even just an inflated ego, he paid attention to how it came across. And what he determined based on his decades of experience is that these people were telling the truth to the best of their ability and that the response in their bodies suggested that they had encountered some sort of traumatic experience, something that was shocking to them. And this, of course, led to his notion of ontological shock. 
Now, what's very interesting about this particular sub-pattern within the totality of the data is that it seems to be focused on a specific endeavor, namely hybridization. So these people weren't just taken as part of a medical kind of survey of planet Earth. They were subjected to medical examination and sometimes even healing was conducted so that they would be healthier, of course. But it seemed to be in service of their role as carriers of this hybrid future, that sperm and ova were extracted so that hybrid beings could be created. So again, this period from the middle part of the 20th century up until around the turn of the millennium seemed to be focused on this kind of enterprise. Not that there were other kinds of beings encountering humans back then and doing different things, but this one pattern of the abduction hybridization phenomenon took place in the latter part of the 20th century, sometimes happening over numerous generations, which again speaks to a genetic component to this. So much of this points to genetics. Now, something else I pointed out before is that different experiencers, which is the term John used to describe these people who had had these encounters, these particular encounters, they were told by these beings that at the end of that period, around the turn of the millennium, the enterprise had proven successful. That while some of the early attempts to hybridize both humans and gray aliens, for instance, hadn't been so successful, and there had been various beings created that failed to thrive, as the expression goes, eventually, with scientific experimentation, they perfected the process so that a very robust kind of being was created that was a genetic mix of a human being and something like a gray alien. And since, therefore, the entire enterprise had come to a successful conclusion, they would be ending this particular chapter in our history and in their history, which means practically that they stopped showing up in those particular ways to abduct human beings, to therefore extract ova and sperm in order to create these new hybrid beings. That isn't to say that abductions never happen anymore and that even hybridization kinds of experiments don't happen, but this particular enterprise seems to have pretty much wrapped up around the turn of the millennium. Even some of the beings then told these various experiencers that they probably would not hear from them for quite some time. And sure enough, that did prove true for many of these people. Again, I know some of them personally. And in fact, it's only recently that they've started experiencing telepathic downloads again, which speaks to the importance of this particular time in our history and also that what was conducted in the latter part of the 20th century in terms of the hybridization experiments leading to new kinds of beings and new possibilities is tied specifically to what is emerging now. That while these experiments took place in the 1990s, it was in preparation for something in our future and perhaps in their future as well. Which of course raises interesting questions about who these beings are, where they come from, and what did they see in our future that prompted them to do what they did then at that particular point in human history. Now, of course, that also raises questions around what was the aim of the hybridization. One notion that's come forward is that it was to make us less aggressive, that we were on this really unfortunate path that was going to end badly, driven largely by our adversarial kind of nature and our aggressive tendencies. So partly what was expected was that by creating a being that is partly gray alien, partly human, you would have a more logical kind of default that was less prone to these sudden emotionally aggressive kind of tendencies. That's one notion that's come forward. Another notion that's been put forward is that this was done because they had come to some sort of evolutionary dead end, that by taking some of our genetic material, they would be able to address some malady in their genetic line, that perhaps they needed fresh stock variants, as it's termed in official circles, in order to get out of some sort of dead end they had stumbled upon. Of course, if that's the case, then that raises further questions around how we would be compatible with them. Now, of course, it may just be that because they are advanced beings with more advanced technology than us, they found a way to do this. But even when you look at them and their humanoid shape and the fact that they are bipedal, two eyes, some semblance of a mouth, two ears, or some semblance of that, some semblance of a nose, two arms, etc., already suggests that somehow they have something in common with us, 
Is it a common ancestor? Or is it perhaps that we share in common that we are both the product of some ancient cosmic seeding program? We've explored those notions as well, including, of course, the possibility most well developed by Michael Masters, suggesting that these beings are our future descendants, and that's why they are compatible with us and that they've returned in time primarily to address this situation in their future, which, of course, in the long scope of things, would also be our future. Now, speaking of time, people have also put forward the notion that they might have arisen in an alternate timeline, perhaps where evolution took a different turn and produced something like the gray alien versus the homo sapien sapien of modern times in our timeline. These were different possibilities put forward. But if we adopt for a moment this sense that perhaps we are both the product of some ancient cosmic seeding program, or that somehow in some naturalistic sense that we don't yet understand, different planets have produced this similar humanoid shape, there's also a notion put forward more recently that perhaps what is being addressed with the hybridization project is a dead end in both of our futures. And this has been suggested, this has been said to certain experiencers, that these beings face a dead end in their future, as do we. Now, theirs may be more pronounced, maybe further along than ours, but in both cases, there's a sense that the hybridization project will address both of those concerns, ideally giving them a better future or a way out of a clear dead end they're in now, as well as address issues that will become more paramount for us over time. And again, when you think about that and you look at the convergence of forces arising in our time, that each pose extinction-level possibilities in our time, then perhaps that notion bears considering. And I would also like to point out that these notions are not mutually exclusive. In other words, I think there are different groups here with subtly different agendas, even if there may be some overlap both in their histories, their origin, and even some of their agendas. But because of that, it's not just that these beings are telling different things to different people, and that suggests some sort of nefarious manipulation, but that actually different groups are interacting with human beings and for subtly different reasons. That's worth considering as well. Now, moving outside of this one particular sub-pattern, I want to point out that there's other kinds of encounters that don't seem to fit this particular pattern and suggest interactions with a different kind of being. For instance, when we think about the kinds of beings that are encountered deliberately through CE5 or HICE, human-initiated contact events or experiences, that, of course, speaks to when human beings proactively, deliberately try to make contact with beings, usually by summoning, you might say, or calling or communicating with these beings across space and time so that when people gather in a meadow or in the forest or in front of their house and they call out to these beings, these phenomena appear in the sky. It's not just lights that appear, sometimes solid craft are seen, and very often there's kind of a telepathic contact that happens. In fact, I myself have had that experience when I was at the Monroe Institute, and I've spoken about that on numerous occasions. But the key here is that these beings appear to be, for all intents and purposes, benevolent. And how do we know that? Well, partly because we don't ever see attacks launched at people, and this doesn't tend to involve abduction. That is part of the other sub-pattern. What usually happens is more of a kind of telepathic kind of contact and communication, sometimes that extends beyond the initial sighting, as in my case. But the messages provided are very much centered around oneness, cosmic connection, and even concerns, perhaps, about our future and the trajectory we are on. And that is one subtle part of the message that does tie in with the messages given during the abduction hybridization campaign which again, I just think speaks to the fact that these beings can see with a broader horizon of time than we can, and they see the writing on the wall. They see where we're going. They have perhaps already seen it. But the key here again is that the kind of beings contacted through CE5 and HICE seem to be of a different nature and a different kind of stage of consciousness. We'll get to stages of consciousness and how that's important a little bit later. But the key here is that when you look at the data, and I do keep asking that we go back to the data, there are very, 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 very few cases that end up leading to not-so-nice encounters. The vast majority are positive. And as I've said before, the outliers 
where a few cases speak about something that wasn't so positive, I think in those cases there are mitigating circumstances. For instance, if you go in with a lot of fear or anger or negative states, then that might call up a different kind of being altogether. Remember, with CE5 and Heist, the goal is to be positive in your intention, to rise up a vibration of positivity, cosmic connection, and from that resonance, you resonate with other beings. That that kind of harmonic resonance is what causes the connection. But if you actually are manifesting something other than that, something more negative, something at a lower vibrational kind of frequency, then that might call in or resonate with a different kind of being, even a kind of parasitic kind of being, which again just speaks to the importance of energetic awareness. In this time more than ever, and I think, as I've been saying for a while now, as our society becomes more clear about the fact that there are different kinds of beings with different origins that often interact with us psychically and in a psychic realm more so than physically, that this kind of energetic awareness is really important. And we will see that become something that is taught in the future. Again, that speaks to some of the things I try to do with Essence of Being. But the point here is just to point out that there are different kinds of beings, different sub-patterns within the data. There are also other kinds of beings that do sometimes pick up people. You could call them a kind of abduction, but they don't seem to involve the kind of entities, the great aliens, the mantis beings, etc., that are part of the other. They seem to be outlier beings, like we think about cases we've discussed on this podcast where there is beings described as Michelin men-looking beings that also could exit that body and become a circling sphere of light. And they could also call out human beings into that same state of being a circling sphere of light. And that this created a sense of oneness and connection beyond the physical body. I think that's a different kind of event altogether with a different kind of being. I don't know that for certain, of course. And some people will argue that these are all just different manifestations of the same underlying phenomenon. That's what John Keel largely believed in terms of his notion of a super spectrum. But I don't think that's the best fit for the data personally. I think we have different kinds of beings from different kinds of origin sources, different kinds of agendas that underlyingly expose these different stages of consciousness. I would also like to point out that while there are these different kinds of beings with different origins, with different agendas that speak to different stages of underlying consciousness, there is this kind of overseeing group that is watching over the entire enterprise to a large degree. And that group has been referred to as the Galactic Confederation, and is also perhaps referred to in ancient scriptural traditions as a divine council. Now, because this overseeing group, this Galactic Confederation, if you want to use that term, is so well attested in the data, in the literature, I do think it's a real thing. The thing is, though, what they are aligned around might be different than what we might expect. They do work for the greatest good. That is their ultimate interest. But because they understand that we are human beings having an experience as a human being, but are actually something much more multidimensional than that, as is every being in the cosmos, and again, this is spoken to with near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and remembering previous lives, reincarnation, these kinds of notions, because they have that in their awareness as just everyday knowledge, how they work with us is different than we might expect. Us being extinguished as a species might not be the worst case scenario in their mind. What they are more centrally focused on is the growth of the entire sort of ecosystem, which is much larger even than this planet, certainly much larger than our individual lives or the evolution of our particular species. Again, I think what this lore points to in a real way is that we are multidimensional beings that have not only just different lives, but different lives expressed as different kinds of beings, including sometimes human beings remembering being gray aliens, for instance, in a previous lifetime. Again, because space-time is illusory, I don't think even previous is the right term there. They might be better considered as simultaneous kind of lifetimes. That because source consciousness is exploring all the permutations of existence in order to better understand itself, that entails many, many different kinds of expressions and lifetimes to fully explore every possibility and therefore arrive at a much more overarching and comprehensive understanding, which again, I think is the point of the entire enterprise. So all that is to say there is a galactic confederation of sorts, but them working for the greatest good involves a greater good that 
is generally eclipsing what we understand as being in play. And again, this is why I brought up notions that are taught in Vedantic circles and whatnot, some of our ancient cosmologies, because that helps us understand with that much more overarching, expansive kind of perspective so that we can make sense of why things are happening the way they are. And that, of course, even frames differently how we look at the events of our lives and even the trajectory of our civilization. Now, of course, over the expanse of 100 episodes, we've also given quite a bit of airtime to the different hypotheses put forward to explain UFOs, aliens, and these mysterious anomalous others. That includes, of course, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the interdimensional hypothesis, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis, and the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, among others. I also discussed something I called the partition hypothesis that speaks to the notion that this larger cosmic community is largely kept just beyond our awareness because of the stage of evolution we're currently at, or we are nearing the possibility of being aware of this cosmic community, but haven't been prepared up until now to encounter that kind of larger reality. Now, what's interesting is that each of these usual players in terms of hypotheses are each quite physicalist and Darwinian in their assumptions. And I think this obviously is a problem because what we've been exploring in this podcast is that physicalist notions are not only not well equipped to deal with the data we see arising through various scientific kind of experiments over the last century or so, but that furthermore and more overarchingly, physicalism is just not tenable as a model. And of course, that's prompted us to go in other directions for instance, exploring idealism, which we've done pretty extensively on this podcast. And again, in a few minutes, we will get into the notion of a holographic universe and how that might also play into a similar kind of way of conceiving of reality. Now, a few moments ago, in addition to the physicalist assumptions that underlie many of the popular hypotheses put forward to explain the UFO phenomenon, I also mentioned that many of these also involve Darwinian assumptions, we have to remember that that is a frame in itself. And philosopher Mary Migley said the following, quote, the theory of evolution isn't just an inert piece of theoretical science. It's a powerful folktale about our origins, the creation myth of our age. It shapes our views of what we are. It influences not just our thought, but our feelings and actions too, unquote. And I think that's key. We spend a lot of time talking about ancient myths and how they are misguided in terms of modern notions. But of course, that's because we are biased. We don't recognize that we operate under a modern myth, this creation myth that Mary Migley spoke to just there in terms of Darwinian assumptions. So that's important to point out that if these physicalist and Darwinian assumptions underlie many of these hypotheses, then perhaps those are also barking up the wrong tree or at least are woefully insufficient. A couple more things to point out in terms of what we've learned as we've looked into these various kinds of topics is that we also need to think about different kinds of data. And I would argue that certain kinds of data that many people exclude shouldn't be excluded. This, of course, involves what people sometimes term anecdotal evidence. For instance, the experiencer lore, what experiencers have been told and what they recount of their experiences. Many people dismiss those kinds of data sources out of hand, saying it's anecdotal, therefore not valid. But of course, as I pointed out many times on this podcast and on Liminal Frames, in courts of law, as part of our legal process, that kind of evidence is considered and is actually used to make a case. And of course, when you have many, many, many anecdotal accounts that contain so many underlying parallels, especially when you consider many of these people are from different walks of life and don't know each other and often had no familiarity with the UFO phenomenon or the abduction phenomenon, this speaks to the fact that they are recounting something real, something that we need to consider, even if it stretches our notions of what is real. So anecdotal evidence is a body of data that we should absolutely consider. In fact, it's one of the most important bodies of data we do need to bring to this conversation. Channeling is another kind of data source that many people reject that I think we do need to consider, while also recognizing that there will be distortions. And by distortion here, I mean an interpretation layer 
a series of filters we all employ to make sense of the world. So because this is coming in in an unconventional way, usually telepathically, then sometimes without us being aware, it can pass through our filters and be subtly changed. So those are the kind of distortions we need to be aware of. Of course, one of those major filters is our overarching stage of consciousness, which I mentioned earlier. So we do need to be aware of that because while any human being can have any kind of state experience, including a kind of euphoric kind of oneness state, they will still interpret that through their current stage of consciousness. So that will change sometimes how they relay the message. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of not just distortions, but also the stage of consciousness of any particular individual who's offering this kind of channeled material. By the way, that's also true for researchers, of course, that different researchers look at data and will pull out different nuggets and therefore form an overarching hypothesis based on their particular stage of consciousness. So we need to be aware of that as well. As I point out in my classes, and as I've said before on this podcast as well, generally people do not see beyond the ceiling of their own stage of consciousness. So if they see other kind of data that actually transcends that, they will misidentify that as an expression coming from a lower stage of consciousness. So for instance, when they hear notions about non-dual transpersonal states and the connectivity of everything, they will sometimes reduce that to a kind of Borg-like hive mind. But there's much more than that going on, especially for these most ascendant beings. But again, if the researcher is not at that stage of consciousness, if they have not had a transpersonal revelation themselves, then they are not going to adequately reflect that because they don't understand it. And we do this sometimes without being aware of it. So this is not a conscious, deliberate skewing of the data. It just speaks to how our interpretive grids always come into play. And therefore, that is something we should be aware of, cognizant of when we hear from different researchers, different channelers, different experiencers. This is just something true of human nature altogether. And of course, speaking of that, that's also true of these various non-human intelligences If they are trying to make accords, as has been spoken about by David Grush with the military industrial complex, and still deal in resource extraction and those kinds of things and power plays, then they are obviously not coming from a transpersonal understanding. Non-dual perspectives speak to oneness, not domination, and is more indicative of something like the raw contact material and the messages entailed in the law of one, which of course speaks to this fundamentally connected nature of everything and everyone. When that is your perspective, then your self-interest changes altogether, the notion of that. And if beings are still trying to manipulate, dominate, control, even through these kinds of accords, that speaks to the fact that they are not at that level, and we should be careful about trusting or even entering into agreements with those kinds of beings. With all that said, let's now move on to this notion of what is the nature of reality itself? Because again, the most interesting questions arise around those notions, because this data, this anomalous data points so often in that direction, again, suggesting that our conventional models, our mainstream models are barking up the wrong tree altogether. Now, people like Bernardo Kastrup have played centrally on this podcast when we've explored the notion of ultimate mind, original mind, the notion that reality itself may actually be about mental processes and that what we perceive as the physical world is just a particular modulation of consciousness waves, if you will. Now, very much connected to this is the notion of holograms and hollow movements. Now, to explore these particular notions and how physical reality as we understand it might not be what it's cracked up to be, We'll be drawing from Michael Talbot's great book, The Holographic Universe, which was published back in the 1990s. This is what Talbot says to introduce this notion of the hologram and a hollow movement. Quote, In the movie Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's adventure begins when a beam of light shoots out of the robot R2-D2 and projects a miniature three-dimensional image of Princess Leia. Luke watches Spellbound as the ghostly sculpture of light begs for someone named Obi-Wan Kenobi to come to her assistance. This image is a hologram, a three-dimensional picture made with the aid of a laser, and the technological magic required to make such images is remarkable. But what is even more astounding is that some scientists are beginning to believe 
the universe itself is a kind of giant hologram, a splendidly detailed illusion no more or less real than the image of Princess Leia that starts Luke on his quest. Put another way, there is evidence to suggest that our world and everything in it, from snowflakes to maple trees to falling stars and spinning electrons, are also only ghostly images, projections from a level of reality so beyond our own, it is literally beyond both space and time. The main architects of this astonishing idea are two of the world's most eminent thinkers, University of London physicist David Bohm, a protege of Einstein's and one of the world's most respected quantum physicists, and Carl Pribram, a neurophysiologist at Stanford University and author of the classic neuropsychological textbook, Languages of the Brain. Intriguingly, Balm and Pribram arrived at their conclusions independently and while working from two very different directions. Bohm became convinced of the universe's holographic nature only after years of dissatisfaction with standard theory's inability to explain all of the phenomena encountered in quantum physics. Pribram became convinced because of the failure of standard theories of the brain to explain various neurophysiological puzzles. Unquote. So this is key. Again, what I've pointed out on this podcast before is that different fields of inquiry are all pointing in the same direction. And this is true of what Balm and Pribham found. And this is something Michael Talbot noticed when he started looking into these notions. It's very compelling when two different leading scientists in different fields altogether arrive at the same kind of notion based on evidence. That gives us much more confidence that this is pointing to something true, something that perhaps speaks to the fundamental fabric of reality itself. Okay, so that sounds promising, but before we proceed further, we should probably look into what a hologram is. How is it generated, and how might this provide clues as to the nature of reality itself? Again, going back to this book, The Holographic Universe, quote, one of the things that makes holography possible is a phenomenon known as interference. Interference is the crisscrossing pattern that occurs when two or more waves, such as waves of water, ripple through each other. For example, if you drop a pebble into a pond, it will produce a series of concentric waves that expands outward. If you drop two pebbles into a pond, you will get two sets of waves that expand and pass through one another. The complex arrangement of crests and troughs that results from such collisions is known as an interference pattern. Any wave-like phenomena can create an interference pattern, including light and radio waves. Because laser light is an extremely pure, coherent form of light, it is especially good at creating interference patterns. It provides, in essence, the perfect pebble and the perfect pond. As a result, it wasn't until the invention of the laser that holograms, as we know them today, became possible. A hologram is produced when a single laser light is split into two separate beams. The first beam is bounced off the object to be photographed. Then the second beam is allowed to collide with the reflected light of the first. When this happens, they create an interference pattern, which is then recorded on a piece of film. To the naked eye, the image on the film looks nothing at all like the object photographed. In fact, it even looks a little like concentric rings that form when a handful of pebbles is tossed into a pond. But as soon as another laser beam, or in some instances, just a bright light source, is shined through the film, a three-dimensional image of the original object reappears. The three-dimensionality of such images is often eerily convincing. You can actually walk around a holographic projection and view it from different angles as you would a real object. However, if you reach out and try to touch it, your hand will waft right through it and you will discover there is really nothing there. Unquote. Now, reflecting on what I just read there, you'll think about, for instance, the work of Donald Hoffman that we've discussed before, and even again the work of people like Bernardo Castrip, who suggested that actual reality out there is nothing like we conceive of it, that it's been translated, turned into an interface with icons for us to be able to navigate it. And what's interesting about the notion of a hologram is that we see this evidenced, that you basically have these interference patterns, these waves, and from that you can generate a three-dimensional object. 
And of course, what's interesting about our particular place in the universe is that we are embedded within it. We are part of the hologram itself, which speaks to the illusory nature of it. And it might be through producing holograms ourselves that we begin to put together clues, potentially pointing to the fundamental nature of reality, or at least giving us an approximation of it. That's again why some people are more comfortable with this notion of a hollow movement. It might not be a hologram per se, but something like that, where actual energy waves when interacted with in a certain way can produce manifest physical objects, three-dimensional objects. Again, this is very, very compelling in terms of how we look at our own universe. What's also interesting here is that different astronomers have also looked at this and wondered the same thing. It began with their exploration of understanding the nature of black holes. For a long time, what used to puzzle scientists, astronomers, astrophysicists, was that when light, for instance, passed through a black hole, it seemed to be lost forever. And of course, that goes against our understanding of how the universe works, where things are always conserved, even if in a different form. But what these astronomers began to recognize was that you could actually store all of the information that could reproduce what had fallen into a black hole in 2D form around the event horizon of the black hole. And this actually solved the problem. But then, of course, this led to a further question, a further wrinkle that was astonishing. What if the entire universe is something like a giant black hole where the information is stored in 2D form around the exterior and that this projects in and creates a kind of holographic reality. And again, with us being part of that holographic reality, that hollow movement, we would have no notion of it being anything other than completely immersively real. And yet you would have no way of knowing from within the hologram whether it is actually a projection from this outer structure that wasn't physical at all. Now, in speaking of a retrospective of sorts, one of the notions we've encountered frequently on this podcast is many of the revelations coming out of quantum mechanics and also hinted at with the UFO phenomenon data is mirrored in ancient Vedantic kind of thinking. Our most ancient cosmologies also point in this direction. And even some of the scientists, the cutting edge leading scientists mentioned in Talbot's book began to recognize this. Jumping back into this book, The Holographic Universe, quote, Tripper realized that if the holographic brain model was taken to its logical conclusions, it opened the door on the possibility that objective reality, the world of coffee cups, mountain vistas, elm trees, and table lamps, might not even exist, or at least not exist in the way we believe it exists. Was it possible, he wondered, that what the mystics had been saying for centuries was true? Reality was Maya, an illusion. And what was out there was really a vast resonating symphony of waveforms, a frequency domain that was transformed into the world as we know it only after it entered our senses, unquote. Now, what Michael Talbot found compelling and that led him to write this book was that, again, different scientists in completely different fields of inquiry were arriving at these same kinds of notions. We just spoke about Pribram and his understanding of the brain as a kind of hollow movement. We also then go to David Baum, who was working in a completely different field, and the implications he began to recognize when he looked into this notion of a hollow movement, perhaps giving rise to all of physical, quote-unquote, reality. Jumping back into the book, quote, Most mind-boggling of all are Baum's fully developed ideas about wholeness, because everything in the cosmos is made out of the seamless holographic fabric of the implicate order, he believes it is as meaningless to view the universe as composed of parts, quote-unquote, as it is to view the different geysers in a fountain as separate from the water out of which they flow. An electron is not an elementary particle. It is just a name given to a certain aspect of the hollow movement. Dividing reality up into parts and then naming those parts is always arbitrary a product of convention, because subatomic particles and everything else in the universe are no more separate from one another than different patterns in an ornate carpet. This is a profound suggestion. In his general theory of relativity, Einstein astounded the world when he said that space and time are not separate entities, 
but are smoothly linked and part of a larger whole he called the space-time continuum. Bohm takes this idea a giant step further. He says that everything in the universe is part of a continuum. Despite the apparent separateness of things at the explicate level, everything is a seamless extension of everything else. And ultimately, even the implicate and explicate orders blend into each other. Take a moment to consider this. Look at your hand. Now look at the light streaming from the lamp beside you and at the dog resting at your feet. You are not merely made of the same things. You are the same thing. One thing, unbroken. One enormous something that has extended its uncountable arms and appendages into all the apparent objects, atoms, restless oceans, and twinkling stars in the cosmos. Bohm cautions that this does not mean the universe is a giant, undifferentiated mass. Things can be part of an undivided whole and still possess their own unique qualities. To illustrate what he means, he points to the little eddies and whirlpools that often form in a river. At a glance, such eddies appear to be separate things and possess many individual characteristics such as size, rate, and direction of rotation, etc. But careful scrutiny reveals that it is impossible to determine where any given whirlpool ends and the river begins. Thus, Bohm is not suggesting that the differences between things, quote-unquote, is meaningless. He merely wants us to be aware constantly that dividing various aspects of the hollow movement into things is always an abstraction, a way of making those aspects stand out in our perception by our way of thinking. In attempts to correct this, instead of calling different aspects of the hollow movement things, he prefers to call them relatively independent subtotalities. Indeed, Baum believes that our almost universal tendency to fragment the world and ignore the dynamic interconnectedness of all things is responsible for many of our problems, not only in science, but in our lives and our society as well. For instance, we believe we can extract the valuable parts of the earth without affecting the whole. We believe it is possible to treat parts of our body and not be concerned with the whole. We believe we can deal with various problems in our society, such as crime, poverty, and drug addiction, without addressing the problems in our society as a whole, and so on. In his writings, Baum argues passionately that our current way of fragmenting the world into parts not only doesn't work, but may even lead to our extinction." Unquote. Now, those of you familiar with my work with Essence of Being will find those ideas very familiar, for it's exactly the same kind of thing I've been saying about the change that needs to happen for us to deal with the challenges we face, and that ultimately all of those challenges, both individually and collectively, all boil down to us misunderstanding who we are and how we're connected to everything and everyone, that we in fact are those things. As I like to say, everything is everything, and I am that, and so are you. And as we draw this 100th episode to a close, I'd like to finish with one more quote that speaks to synchronicity and the possibilities that await us if we were able to see reality differently, see reality in this fundamentally interconnected way. And here Talbot will refer to the work of David Peet, who wrote a book titled Synchronicity, the bridge between matter and mind. Quoting from the book one more time, quote, Put another way, Pete thinks that synchronicities reveal the absence of division between the physical world and our inner psychological reality. Thus, the relative scarcity of synchronous experiences in our lives shows not only the extent to which we have fragmented ourselves from the general field of consciousness, but also the degree to which we have sealed ourselves off from the infinite and dazzling potential of the deeper orders of mind and reality. According to Pete, when we experience a synchronicity, what we are really experiencing is the human mind operating for a moment in its true order and extending throughout society and nature, moving through orders of increasing subtlety, reaching past the source of mind and matter into creativity itself, unquote. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition 
of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian or by subscribing on Spotify. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian signing out.